It's great to have you here on the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you with knowledge so you are empowered to make better financial decisions in your life. I'm going back to basics today with something that is a constant question and complaint we're getting right now about auto insurance and the massive premium increases. So what do you actually need to have with your auto insurance? And later, tough topic. None of us like to talk about this. We're aging or we have a relative who's aging, a parent who's aging, and what they're really thinking, what they need, and what do they need from you they're not asking for right now. So the auto insurance market is in turmoil right now. People are seeing gigantic increases in their auto insurance premiums. And in many states, the odds that you're going to get hit by somebody who's not carrying insurance It's gone way up because the premiums have gotten so high, a lot of people who prior had auto insurance aren't carrying it anymore. So what do you do about this? I mean, obviously, we've talked about how people are shopping more than they did before. A lot of people just renew with the same company year after year after year after year. And so when you do that, you're competing with yourself. I mean, you have no idea if what you're being quoted is okay or not. Well, the very large increases many of us are receiving has made people more aware. And I was reading a report in Barron's about the auto insurers, and believe it or not, they're not being robber barons. It would be so convenient and nice if we could say that they were being bad guys and ripping us off. But do you know that most auto insurers are running the equivalent of charities right now? They are taking in a certain amount of money and paying out significantly more in claims. And for some of the insurers, it's unreal how much more they're paying out in claims than they're taking out in dollars. And so the insurers are like, what are we going to do? And so they have been pushing the rates up. Some states more than others. Some, you know, insurance is regulated by the states. And some states allow an insurer to charge what's called at market. And others, they have to go through this rate setting process and all that. So it delays the ultimate higher prices, but the deal is prices are headed higher, but not the same with every insurer because different insurers calculate risk differently, run more efficient operations than others and things like that. So what you're quoted for what you get could be very different depending on who you're with. But going without or buying minimums can be very, very risky. So let's talk about what you got to have. You need to have liability, particularly if you have any assets. Because if you don't have good liability coverages and an accident is an oops, it's your fault, you can get wiped out. Now, I've shared stories from time to time of wealthy individuals who got cheap, bought state minimums, and ended up bankrupt because they didn't have sufficient coverage for a judgment that would come later. So you having liability coverage is really key. And although the terms will vary from state to state, having uninsured and underinsured motorist coverage on your auto insurance, that's something you really need because the number of people without insurance and the number of people buying at state minimums is going up, meaning that even in an accident, it's not your fault, you could have significant cost exposure because they're underinsured or uninsured. Now, 
I just said things you have to have. But then there's a question, should you be insuring your vehicle or car or truck or whatever you want to call it for the value of the vehicle for collision? If the vehicle that you have or car is really old, then probably not. Because the value that the insurer will pay you for your car could be so low that the premiums are not worth it. The traditional formula is when the premiums for a collision exceed 10% of the remaining value of the vehicle, which you can look up online pretty easily, get a, get a wide ballpark estimate, then you're best off being your own insurance company for the car if it ends up being totaled and it's your fault or you get hit by an uninsured person. And that will cut some cost out for you. Uh, in that case as well, comprehensive, if you have an older car, you may not want comprehensive either, which pays for things that happen that are um, non, not actually in an accident. Tree falls on your car, who knows what. So what I want you to do, if you can, is raise the deductible on your auto insurance if you are carrying collision comprehensive. Have it higher because that will have a direct impact on premiums. And the insurer can quote you, or if you use an agent, the difference in what your premiums would be on a monthly, six-month, or annual basis if you raise the deductible, just make sure if you have a loan on your car, it's never higher than what's required by your lender. They may say you can't have a deductible higher than 1000 or you can't have it. Uh, that would usually be what it is. I can't imagine one having it. It can't be higher than 500 There will be a break point where it will be definitely to your advantage to have that higher deductible because you don't want to make small claims anyway. And once you figure out what the coverages are you should have, that's when you can really do some good work shopping with various insurers to see where your coverage is going to be. Uh, good news, following an accident, the long, long waits people were having getting repairs, those have really shrunk a lot, not to normal, but closer to normal back to more like they were before 19, not like they've been the last few years when it could take months and months and months to get body work done to your car after an accident. Krista? Okay, this first question is from Martin in Georgia. My special needs daughter uses an American Express Bluebird card for her community outings. I load $20 per week as a safeguard for her misplacing the card or if it fell into the wrong hands. Bluebird now charges a $3.74 fee for loading the card. Can you recommend another card without a fee? And that fee was added when you reload at Walmart? Walmart. Walmart and American Express always had a, this was a joint venture for them. I guess the joint venture period ended, and Walmart no longer does the deal with Bluebird where you can reload one for free at a Walmart. They now have a new deal with Family Dollar. Don't know if there's a Family Dollar store near you. You can reload for free at Family Dollar on a Bluebird card. You also, by direct deposit from your checking account, can load onto this card for your daughter, and that will be free. Uh, as an alternative, if Bluebird becomes too hard to use to avoid fees, you could use what I call a piece of trash, fake Visa or fake MasterCard, set up an account with a debit card for your daughter where you do your banking or credit union stuff, wherever you do that stuff, and you can move money over from your account for free, and with a debit card, you can set a daily spending limit, just like you're able to do with Bluebird. You're able to limit what your special needs daughter could spend and cash in that weekly put, outing. You could put cash withdrawals at zero, too. Right. So you don't have to worry that she'd go to an ATM and pull money out. 
So that would be... Or someone steals a card. I mean, that's yeah. true. So that would be another way for you to do it. But I'll, the Bluebird cards work very well for people in so many different situations. And I'm sorry, the relationship between Walmart and, and American Express seems to have deteriorated for some reason. This is from David in Virginia. My daughter will be studying abroad in Lugano. Am I saying that right, Switzerland? Lugano, I think that's how you say it. It's a great place. She will have a EuroRail pass and will have three 10-day breaks. Any destination wow. location suggestions you might have for a student? Any suggestions for lodging for students? I don't want her in bad sections of town. Are hostels still a thing? Hostels are still a thing. Uh, hostels can vary in quality. She will be traveling around with other students, and they will pal around together, and they will make mistakes or make good decisions together. It's part of what happens when people do study abroad. And in a lot of European cities, there are areas that students congregate, and depending on the city, they can be a little sketch or be okay. Uh, the students who go to Switzerland or southern Germany very heavily use their Eurails to go to Italy. They love running down to Italy. It's more affordable for student getaways. There's so much fun there and a lot of, a lot of um, fellow students in the big Italian cities and smaller ones as well. And I think she'll, be, she'll do better than you think. But if you're nervous, you can help her. I remember for my oldest daughter who did study abroad in Germany, and then did all kinds of trips. Um, on, she did a lot of flights on Ryanair. She, she can tell funny stories. Rebecca can tell funny stories about being on Ryanair. But anyway. If you want to laugh, too, look at Ryanair's social media. They're hilarious. They post memes about themselves. So the uh, biggest airline in Europe now. Anyway, uh, I would help her with suggestions because I travel so much. I knew, you know, stay out of this part of town, go to this part of town. In some cities, I would help her by helping her and her friends book places to stay. And that's because I have this unusual advantage that I travel so much and I knew what to do. It's harder for you, David, if it's not your thing normally so I think it's more a conversation with your daughter. You know, you got to be careful. Some of these cities will have rough part of town, just like you might have anywhere in the United States, and have that conversation. Now, you traveled the way that David's daughter Forever may ago. well travel. I did. But you, you talk about some of the greatest experiences of your life. It was great. I mean, we stayed in all hostels. Um, except I had an amazing break with my aunt and uncle who were living in, outside Geneva, Switzerland. So that was, I had a real bed. That was amazing. Um, but I did this, but we didn't have the internet available to us back then. So I would read, I would encourage her to read tons of reviews on ho if they're using hostels or staying at a small hotel or Airbnb, because, you know, I would only stay in places that I'm sure the students, the other people have been at hostels and young people would talk about the safety of the area and David, and. that's the thing, is that the students all kind of do this as a rugby scrum. And so the worry about danger is not, uh, it's something any of us as parents have about our kids. But the chances of danger are very remote. The likeliest thing that happens to college students as they travel around is they get their wallet stolen or their passport stolen or something like that having a really good money belt that you wear under your clothing, very, very valuable. And not over imbibing, not that your daughter would, but that was when people got in trouble on my, my daughter's abroad trip recently. She had some stories about people getting um, on her trip who got pretty drunk and got robbed and things like that, so yikes. Most of the problems happen late at night when people have consumed too much alcohol. Dennis in Oklahoma says, I've just paid off a credit card and it has a $7,000 limit on it. My question is, should I close that card or leave it open to improve my credit score? Leave it open, leave it open, leave it open. 
you don't want to close credit card accounts unless, let's say, a card had no annual fee and you're getting rid of it because they now have an annual fee. In that case, you always want to replace it with another card that doesn't have an annual fee. I call it, uh, you know, hopscotch your credit because you want to make sure that you always have a good amount of available credit. In this case, Dennis, set up something that you regularly pay and set it as a small auto pay on it that there's charge activity on it every single month and you just got to pay that every month so that you keep that card active and keep that credit available to you. Because closing a, a card doesn't really matter so much in that aging thing people talk about. What really matters is the ratio, how much of your available credit you're using and so that's why you don't want to give up that $7,000 of available credit. And we have a briefing at Clark.com because we've been hearing from more people who have old cards that out of nowhere, they're getting a notice that the card has been closed to an inactivity. We have a simple guide how to make sure you keep your cards active that you're no longer using so that they help you in your overall credit standing credit mix and credit score. And coming up ahead, there's conversations we as adult children are uncomfortable having with our aging parents, grandparents, whatever it is. We need to have those conversations. We're going to talk about that. So I was looking at my monthly statements from last month from Vanguard and yes, I still got paper statements on financial accounts. I think that's a good idea. And in there was this glossy thing about how probably because maybe I'm being paranoid that it was because of my age. But anyway, it was a thing in there. Uh, have you assigned a trusted person for your account? And they have this thing at Vanguard because it's a... Uh, it's a record that's, that's playing a bad hit over and over and over again. Gosh, that's an old analogy, talking about a record. Anyway, bad tape? No, nobody uses tape anymore. Anyway, where someone starts losing their capabilities to some degree, and I'm a bank, I'm a financial house, I'm a brokerage, and I don't know, what am I going to do? Who am I going to talk to? Am I going to tell the courts? I mean, am I going to call the police? What am I going to do? And so what more and more financial houses are doing is proactively, they're sending out these things, appoint a trusted representative. If And it's really frank on the one from Vanguard. Basically, if we're concerned about you, who can we talk to? <laughs> concerned about you <laughs> yeah anyway they're making it uh something that that instead of them trying to figure out what to do they call the person you appoint and they say hey you know uh checked on mom lately <laughs> you know whatever because they're starting to get concerned about uh judgment decisions whatever and it happens at different points in life, different ages. But this is the kind of thing parents hate talking to their kids about their accounts, their money, and all that. Parents are like so often super secretive and they're like really wanting to be left alone and have their independence. But then that puts them at risk of all these fraudsters that are targeting people that are older. And so if you have an account with Vanguard or you have an account wherever and they have a thing where you can appoint a trusted person, doesn't have to be a family member because sometimes we don't trust our family, and you can appoint that person and that's who they're going to contact if they start getting worried about transactions you're doing, uh, money you're withdrawing, money you want to wire, whatever, having that person there is really valuable. Also, uh, this is a conversation often you as an adult child need to have with a parent. You need to make sure 
they have a durable power of attorney for health care or whatever the state equivalent is in the state they live in where they appoint a message and a messenger. Now, this is the things that I want. Like for me, I have, I have done these documents, and in my case, I want no extraordinary means to keep me alive if I've got no prospect for you know, a, a normal life moving forward. You, know, you, you select what things you want, what you don't want. Uh, the DNR, you know, I'm a do not resuscitate person if I'm like hopeless. I don't want to be resuscitated. But this is the thing everybody has to make their own decisions about. But don't keep them in your head. Get them on paper. Have that. And have the person you want to be the person carrying out your wishes. That's your representative. And these are, again, state statutory normally. There will be a standard state form in most states for this durable power of attorney for health care. Then you have another question. Do you want to have a regular durable power of attorney for financial matters? And that gets really sensitive, many cases more sensitive than the health care one. Because then you're having to decide who it is you're going to let be your legal representative in handling finance if you start to slip. And sometimes you're not going to know you are. So these are things that, what do we do as adult kids? We talk about it to our siblings maybe or to our spouse or significant other or whatever, but do we talk about it with the person we need to talk about it with, our parent? No, we don't because we're uncomfortable doing it. Get past that and have the conversation. It's so important to protect them, to protect their assets, to have these conversations. And then let's get into more uncomfortable territory need to have the conversation and by the way you should do this with your significant other boyfriend girlfriend spouse what do you want to have happen at the time of your passing because we don't decide when that's going to happen the clock sometimes catches up with us younger older or in between and you don't want to leave those grieving behind having to figure this out so you want to have these conversations because I know people avoid them like the plague but what if the plague comes along and then they got to make a decision don't put that burden on them have your wishes carried out mine I want my body donated to science and whatever they don't want well then it's disposed of cremated and Many times you can enter into an arrangement with a, a university-based medical center and you don't even have the cost of disposal because they got your body and then they're the ones who have to dispose of it. I don't want to cost anybody anything at the time I die and whatever I have that's useful to somebody else, I want it to, I'm an organ donor, I want it to all be donated. If somebody wants my terrible eyesight, they can have my terrible eyesight, whatever it is. They want one of my vital organs. It's yours. You can have it because that's my wishes. And I know other people may cringe at that. Other people may want to be buried in the ground. You may want some kind of fancy casket. You may want to be buried in one of those, what do you call those things above ground? Were they, is that called a, like a crypt? crypt? Yeah. Um, whatever it is you want, don't make your loved ones try to guess. Let them know. The more you do this, the more it's a favor to you and the more it's a favor to them. So my assignment for you, if you have avoided having these conversations, uh, don't try to have them all at once. And don't just wait for when it feels like it's the right time. It will never be the right time to have that conversation. You just do it. Is that like Nike? Just do it? Is yep. that their slogan it still? It is. Yep, just do okay. it. Okay. All right, we'll go to some questions now. This one's from Isaac in Washington. 
I wanted your opinion on my crypto holdings. I invested $500 in 2020, mainly in Bitcoin and Ethereum, just enough that I wouldn't mind losing all of it. I thought of it as a long-term investment, but now I'm not so sure. It did well for a while, but the current balance is around $300. My question is, should I cut my losses and sell or persevere and chalk it up to diversification? So Isaac, you bought crypto feeling like it was going to be a part of the future. There are those, uh, even though we never hear from them anymore. We used to hear crypto, 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 crypto all the time. Um, having digital currencies, it's going to be part of the future in some way, shape, form, or fashion. We don't know how it's going to work for real over time because we're in the early pioneering stages still. And if you've got three, what was 500 is now 300, and it could go to zero or it could go up from here, uh, I doubt that it's in any way changing your overall investment profile, your overall financial security. You bought it originally because it was something you believed in. I think you can ride it either way, and I, I don't see a problem with you continuing to hold it. Do I buy crypto? No way, not ever. I, it's not my thing. And crypto is not a mature market, not even close, because it's not real money yet. You cannot go in somewhere and routinely buy and sell things with crypto like you would with U.S. dollar or whatever currency of wherever you are. So that's why crypto was a story rather than a real thing to this point. But who knows how it will be forward. And if the $300 is not material in your life, I guess you could ride it. I think we'll probably get a few Clark Stinks out of that one that you just said. But we'll see. It's From not real money. In it. well, Crypto is not real money. Okay. So all of you are going to send in the Clark Stinks. No, Please do so. Let's just wait so. for them. Yeah, we'll wait. Okay. You can respond then. Let's go to all right. these questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is a story from Janet in Georgia. Regarding class action lawsuits, you've mentioned the biggest checks that people have received for being a claimant of one of these suits. Well, I may break that record. About five or six years ago, I happened upon a class action suit against Blue Buffalo Pet Food Online. I had not heard of this previously, and I don't believe it had been well publicized. That is what I feed my dogs because I thought it was a very good quality brand. I was so mad because the lawsuit said that they lied about their ingredients. It said you had to send in your receipts to claim up to a maximum of $200. At that time, I could retrieve my receipts, and I sent a few, spent a few hours requesting these and pu putting them together to send in. I took the time because of the principle of the matter. I received a check for $1,485. Wait, 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 wait. The class action said that the maximum amount per claimant would be 200. Mm -hmm. And you got $1,485? Mm -hmm. What happened here? Says, I was shocked, no explanation. I guess not many customers applied to be members of the class action. It could be that, because um, a lot of class actions will say an amount uh, estimated to be of, and then it'll end up being a lot smaller could be that the judge did not accept the original tentative agreement and then the the agreement was modified when have we ever heard somebody getting that much money from a class action we haven't um so but, janet says that's probably the total cost that she submitted of the food she fed her dog wow yeah. All right, Eric in Colorado says, I will be retiring in 2027. My wife and I plan to do a world cruise, probably with Viking Ocean Cruises, in 2028. The tickets usually become available two years in advance, and the suites sell out within hours. Who should we use to book the cruise? How should we pay? What kind of trip insurance should we consider? Is there anything else we should be thinking of? And I put the estimated cost there for you. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know why you didn't say it, because... With, with these world cruises, you're typically talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to says, more than a million well, his, his, based on the cabin category you go into for around the world cruise, also depending on how long around the world. Eric's is estimated $250,000. That's quite a retirement gift, quarter million. I wonder how long this round the world cruise is but anyway um you're you are an advanced planner because you're looking five years out i'm so impressed and that you know this is 
something you want to do. So I don't know if you regularly go on cruises, Eric. You do one-week cruises, uh, five-day cruises, whatever. I would say if you are someone who goes on shorter cruises, and if you've never been on one, I want you to go on a shorter cruise before you commit to doing this, just to make sure that cruising is something you'd really enjoy. Um, there are many cruise-only agents here in Colorado. There are going to be a ton in Denver, smaller number in Colorado Springs. Not as for, Maybe Boulder will have some. Um, a cruise-only agent or a cruise specialist, who this is what he or she does. That's the kind of person you're going to want helping you with this. So with the cruises you take the next uh, five years before you would go on this one, I want you to test drive some various cruise specialists. Find the person who really listens to you, who seems to understand you, who seems very knowledgeable about cruises, and then that's who you would use to book this cruise. I don't want you out of nowhere for this big, big, big event in your life to just pick someone. I want you to have an opportunity to test them over these next several years. And definitely, if you've not test cruises, um, I want you to pay by, if they'll permit you and you have the credit limit, I want you to pay by credit card. As far as the trip insurance you're going to have, so depending on how long the cruise is, that's very significant because you could buy for the specific cruise. Or you may want to buy an annual trip insurance policy. Make sure that whatever you buy, when you buy it in three years, that it includes supplier default. Uh, the cruise industry is one that has a lot of companies that have been around a long time that have been very successful, and then one day they're just gone. So you always want to have supplier default as part of any trip insurance policy you buy with tours or with cruises. Very significant. You buy the trip insurance at the time you pay the initial cost of the trip. So any pre-existings you may have are covered. And uh, I am very impressed because I don't even know what I'm doing five hours from now. And you're talking about five years from now. It's incredible. And I want to thank you so much for listening today. And Clarkies, we're starting the new Clarkie segment soon. And if you've got a Clarkie you want to leave, call 404 981 2071. So a Clarkie means like you're calling in to tell us something, why you listen, or just say something. You don't have a question, you just wanted to say something. Something you feel like is an important message for your fellow listener or viewer and you want to share it and you leave the message and then we may well play it on a future episode so what do we do for our youtube folks i mean we need well, like, they hear it too. we need like a picture for of yeah. the person who's the clark no, we haven't gotten that, we that sophisticated yet but yeah maybe we, we need to get with that okay well you crawl before you walk you walk before you run you run before you marathon Never did a marathon. Did six half marathons. Never had the guts to do a full. Did you ever do a... I did the Marine Corps marathon. That's right. Never this, again. This woman's tough. <laughs> you could have been a Marine. No way. Okay, so I got to tell... Uh, no way. I know They're we're tough. done, but I got to tell this story. So we were doing... Uh, back when I did a TV show at HLN, we used to do... Operation Clark Smart, which were broadcasts that we did on television where I uh, would go to a military post, military base, Air Force base, naval, naval base, and I'd meet with the troops and talk to them about money because uh, historically military personnel, particularly enlisted personnel, are not very good with money. So we're doing one at what used to be called Fort Benning. I don't know what it's called now. But it's where Army Ranger School is. So Krista comes up with the bright idea uh, with the public affairs office there for she and I to go do Army Ranger PT training 
the morning of our broadcast. I was 54. Those, those uh, soldiers were like 18. And, you know, you're a woman, so you don't have to disclose what your age was then. But anyway. I have to do the math. I don't, I don't care. So you were 38, I okay. think. Okay, thank you. And Krista was out doing those 18, 19, 20-year-old rangers. Not. Yes, you were. You're still an exaggerator. I am not. It was crazy how good you were at it. And I'm over there huffing and puffing, and I'm not blowing down any house. I'm not... Which, which yeah. fable that's is that? That's the three, that's the, the red, Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood. I was not blowing anything down. And then I'm with the base general who's doing the PT run with me. And the guy just wants to go. I mean, he's like incredible shape. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like just dying doing that. And we're getting further and further behind the recruits. And I'm not sure, because I was three times their age, I'm not sure then that even if I was their age, I would have been tough enough to do Army Ranger training. You're plenty but tough. And you, you, Krista, you could have done it. Well, thank you. But I feel like those guys are way tougher than I ever could be. My cousin uh, was a career Marine, Michael, and he was so impressive. Like, I, I can't even believe the tales of what they go through with basic training and just how dedicated you have to be to be a member of any segment of the military. So there you go, though. I mean, you did the police officer firefighter thing. You throw out the Marine card after we were talking about Army Rangers. I said any member of the military. I agree. Okay. I grew up right near West Point. My first job was there. I can't imagine what, you know, it's it's really amazing people who volunteer voluntarily dedicate themselves that way and join the military. So that was what I did at, at Fort Benning with you. And then when I was at Fort Hood in Texas, what did they have me do there? Do you remember that? No. That was when, that's where they trained the army dogs. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah. And these are the biggest, toughest dogs you've ever seen. And so they- You're 10 feet tall. They got me, they got me in this, this uh, thing that's for trainers. And they send me out there and then the dogs come and attack you. <laughs> and they'd say, all right, run, Clark. It was like, run, Forrest, run. I bet you ran but fast that time. <laughs> not fast enough. So I start running. I think I've gone like 15 yards. And all of a sudden, this giant dog jumps up, takes me to the ground, and is biting on me like, like you can't imagine. I had these bruises. You had the big suit on, though, right? Yeah, but I still got bruised from it. And then they said, you know, this is so funny. We just had players from the Dallas Cowboys and the Houston Texans here, and none of them would do it. And you did it. I'm like, that's the only time I've ever been compared See, you're brave. to an NFL player. No, I'd say I was dumb to do that. But I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, enough for today. <laughs> <laughs> if you're still with us yeah if you're still with us on this. thank you thank you clarky you're really a clarky if you're still with us have a great one bye